Hello and welcome to this latest Lowy Institute live event. This is part of what we are calling the Long Distance Lowy Institute, in which we communicate our content and analysis online, while we are unable to do so in person. A very warm welcome to everyone joining us from Australia and to those dialing in from overseas, and a warm welcome also to our Lowy Institute corporate members and supporters. My name is Dr. Roger Shanahan. I'm a research fellow here at the West Asia Program at the Lowy Institute. Now, it's certainly an exciting time to be an Emirati these days, as the country is quickly racking up an impressive list of technological firsts. Last month, the UAE launched the Arab world's first interplanetary mission when the Mars orbiter called Amal, or HOPE, took off from a launch site in Japan, and it's expected to arrive at Mars in February next year. And this month, the first nuclear power station in the Arab world went online in Abu Dhabi. But the country is also an increasingly active political actor in the region. Joining me to today to discuss the UAE's view of and its role in the region is the UAE's Minister of State for Foreign Affairs, Dr. Anwar Gargash. Dr. Gargash is a member of the Federal Cabinet of the United Arab Emirates, and he has served as the Minister of State for Foreign Affairs since 2008. Between 2006 and 2016, Dr. Gargash was the Minister of State for the Federal National Council Affairs. In addition to his ministerial portfolios, Dr. Gargash was Chairman of the National Elections Committee, overseeing the UAE's first elections, which took place in 2006, and the subsequent elections in 2011 and 2015. He was also a board member of the Dubai Chamber of Commerce and Industry from 1997 to 2006 but he has an even more impressive academic record, having received his PhD from King's College, Cambridge, and he holds bachelor's and master's degrees in political science from George Washington University. Before I go to our guests, some quick housekeeping. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q and A button where you can submit questions to the panelists. We'll put as many of your questions as possible to Dr. Gargash later in the discussion. So please include the name of your organisation or any affiliation when you send through your question. But first, of course, I have some, indeed many questions for our panellists. So first of all, I'd like to welcome you uh, to the Lowy Institute online, Dr Gargash, and thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedule uh, to join us. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's great to be here and to speak to uh, this very esteemed uh, think tank and to the to those who are watching us. Now, firstly, um, I'd like to have us look at Emirati-Australian relations. And on the surface, they appear to be very good. Uh, the UAE has long hosted our deployed air elements and deployed national headquarters of the Australian Defence Force assets in the Middle East. And while our trade relationship for a long time had centred on vehicles, oil and foodstuffs, with the end of vehicle manufacturing in Australia, it's now become more diversified. There are three Australian universities who have campuses in the UAE. There are around 300 companies and around 20,000 uh, Australian expatriates who are based there now. We also have a bilateral agreement on the peaceful use of nuclear energy, which allows for the importation of Australian uranium at some stage in the future. But one of the limits to further expansion in our bilateral economic relationship is the inability of Australia to secure a free trade agreement with the GCC countries. Negotiations with the UAE began in 2005, but Australia was then advised that there would be a unified GCC free trade agreement. And negotiations for that started in 2007 until 2009, but they stalled after the GCC announced a review. And now given the disagreement, uh, with Qatar since 2017, there's little resolution in sight for an Australian GCC free trade agreement. Now, Dr. Gargash, first of all, can I ask you, uh, firstly, how uh, the UAE views Australia uh, as a country uh, and its relations in the region, and particularly with the UAE, and whether you think our economic relations or our bilateral economic relations can ever reach their full potential uh, without an FTA being signed? Well, again, I think uh, to start with, uh, the, our relations with Australia are uh, excellent. They are, I think, uh, to a certain extent, a model 
where uh, the relationship transcends the distance, the, the distance and the time zone, etc. I think we've managed uh, to do that uh, because of several things. We've got great links, airline links, between the UAE and Australia, and that certainly has helped sort of shrink uh, the distance and make uh, uh, sure that uh, uh, this relationship, uh, you know, is not somehow uh, seen as a relationship with uh, a very distant country. That's the way we view it. I think, again, uh, we've got also several other aspects that are important here. I, I would suggest that, uh, you know, the effort of many Australian companies also to uh, uh, be present in Middle Eastern markets and use the UAE as a logistical hub uh, has also played an important role uh, in this. There are about 300 Australian companies that are located in, in the UAE. Uh, I would also say that over the years, what has mostly been uh, commercial uh, transactional uh, relationship is moved uh, with, I would say, a slower pace. And I think this is where we need to work more uh, to other aspects, to, uh, uh, you know, to a better understanding on counterterrorism. I think Australia values uh, highly, uh, you know, our views on how you see the region because the OE has been quite consistent in, uh, in, in how it sees the region. Uh, you might agree with it, you might disagree with it, but the UAE speaks one uh, language and that will be in closed doors and it will be also in public forums. And I think this is comforting when you build uh, those relationships. Having said that, um, I would say that this is a constant debate also that we have here, which is we need to spend more time on uh, various countries uh, and Australia is always the, one of the top of the lists. It's one of those countries where we need to put more effort, more time, more concentration. Uh, you have to realize that any uh, country in our region uh, can allow itself to be consumed by the problems of the region. And I think the UAE, while having to manage also the problem of its neighborhood, uh, is always conscious and cognizant of the necessity of uh, investing more effort and time in what I would call win-win uh, relationships uh, such as Australia, where you, know, you don't really have a fundamental uh, political issue uh, hindering the development of that relationship. Vis-a-vis -vis the GCC angle, I mean, I would agree with you. Uh, we took a decision a few years ago uh, in the GCC context of, uh, of, of doing FTAs as a group. And we thought that the you know, collective volume makes us in a better negotiating uh, place when, uh, you know, when we sign these FTAs with economies that are larger than our you know, single entity uh, in the GCC. Unfortunately, that has also led to, uh, to uh, delays uh, and, uh, in, in, uh, in signing many of these FTAs. And as you know, I mean, trying to get uh, you know, the consensus of six countries is different than a, a single decision by a single uh, country. So these are also some of the issues that I would say that your description of them are quite apt. Uh, and I think that we in the UAE also feel frustrated because among uh, the GCC countries, I think we see ourselves as uh, the one that is uh, much more open to free trade and much more open towards, uh, you know, a sort of embracing these FTAs. Thanks very much, Dr. Gargash. Now, I'd, I'd like to perhaps focus a little bit more specifically on, on the UAE. And uh, as I mentioned before, um, you are becoming a much more active um, um, player, not only in the region, but internationally over the last uh, 10 to 15 years. Um, 
and that includes the use of your military force. And, and normally, given the size constraints of the UAE, it was normally part of a broader Western or international coalition. You, know, you sent forces to Kosovo, to Somalia under the UN, and to Afghanistan. Um, and the former Secretary of Defence, General Jim Mattis, described your country as uh, little Sparta um, in recognition of uh, your ability to generate forces from a, a small country uh, and very capable forces. Um, now, more recently, though, um, the UAE has been part of a series of interventions that have not gone well. Uh, you supplied significant air, land and sea assets to Yemen as part of the Saudi-led Operation Decisive Storm, which was ostensibly launched, you know, and I quote, to defend the UN-recognised government of Yemen and to save the Yemeni people from Houthi aggressors. And when it was launched, it promised a swift resolution to the issue. Yet five years later, the UAE has now completed the withdrawal of its troops from Yemen with really little to show uh, for those five years worth of efforts. And in Libya, the UAE, along with France and Russia, uh, have backed the forces of General Haftar against a UN recognized government of national accord. And General Haftar's forces were decisively defeated in their attempts, their year long attempts to capture the capital Tripoli in June this year. And now the Turkish backed government appears to be in the ascendancy. Now, do you think that the UAE is perhaps uh, overreaching now in terms of its military deployments, in terms of the last two significant um, um, sides that you've backed in regional conflicts? Well, I think to start with, uh, the UAE is, uh, in terms of you know uh, rough size, uh, the UAE is a medium-sized country in our region. Uh, vis-a-vis -vis its political presence, vis-a-vis -vis a population of, uh, of around 10 million people. But uh, economically, the UAE is the third largest economy in the Middle East. Uh, Turkey is the first, Saudi Arabia is the second, the UAE is the third. It has an economy larger than Iran, and it has an economy larger than Israel. So from an economic turn, the UAE is an important player uh, in the region. Now, I think to understand our thinking here, our thinking really revol revolves around three things. Number one is we are uh, living in a very changing international uh, you know, system. And the idea that uh, the UAE can actually go back to uh, what people see as a typical Gulf state rentier model is, uh, is, is something that the international system has changed. It's a different international system, which means that you have to take some responsibility for the, uh, for the peace and security of the region. You know, the whole, you know, sort of certainty of uh, a two pole world or uh, a U.S. you know unipolar world, etc., uh, is no longer there. I mean, these continue to be major players, but we also see an international system that is changing. So, an important part of why we are involved in some of these uh, issues of uh, uh, peace and stability is because we feel uh, the ground shaking under us. And we feel that we have to take certain responsibilities to do with our own uh, region, region security. I think that's number one. I think number two is uh, that we also understand that our relationships with other parties that we expect to, uh, to, to like-minded countries should be really a two-way street. And from that perspective, our forces were in Afghanistan for over 10 years because you can't expect others to help you if you're not willing really to help uh, your friends, your larger friends, and be valuable to them as you expect that they will be valuable to you if a national emergency uh, arises. So our understanding also is that the passive model of a Gulf state uh, no longer uh, is no longer acceptable as the you know the sort of 
issues around peace and stability in the region change. You have to actually uh, add value. You have to be seen as uh, a burden sharing partner. And I think from that perspective, you've seen us in NATO, uh, in the Balkans, you've seen us in NATO in Libya. We have to remember that our current involvement in Libya is a legacy involvement because we were part of the NATO also operation. And you know, you can't just turn these things on and turn, turn them off, assuming. I think the third important element here is, uh, is the issue of uh, working with uh, like-minded friends. So this is the rule for us. We don't work alone. You know, the idea of overextension that you spoke about, I think we're trying to counter it by saying, you know, we don't really have what I would say the political and military gravitas to work alone. So everywhere really that you see us playing a role, we're uh, a member of the team, uh, we're a constructive member, we're a member that brings, uh, you know, some uh, advantage and, 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 and real contribution, but we never work alone. And I think this addresses some of the issues that you hear about is the UAE overextending? And I would say, you know, the UAE is never alone in any of the theaters that you mentioned. I mean, in, 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 in Libya, I would, uh, I would correct you, but we're really working with the French and uh, the Egyptians, and it depends with some other European com countries, depending on, the, on, on, a, uh, on, on a certain day, whether they feel that this is the issue of counterterrorism is major as we see it, or the issue of counterterrorism is secondary uh, as, as, as they might see it on that day. Now, I, I have also to take issue with Yemen. Um, I would say that uh, Yemen is a very complicated war. And again, <clears throat> the issue is, was there a clear victory? I would argue that all recent wars really in the region have been uh, very difficult and, uh, and, and, and very, uh, and, and very also difficult to come and say that there was a clear victory there. I mean, I mentioned Afghanistan as an example. I mentioned Iraq as an example. You don't really, and here you have also the might of the United States behind the operations uh, in Afghanistan with NATO and the might of the United States with a huge coalition in Iraq. But you don't really end up with a clear victory as we uh, sometimes, you know, mythically sea wars. And I think vis-a-vis -vis Yemen, there are things that we achieved and that there are things we did not achieve. But I think what we achieved mostly in Yemen was, uh, was we denied a major geostrategic shift in Iran's favor in Yemen. I mean, again, this was supposed to be a big, big victory for Iran, where suddenly you have a pro-Iranian militia controlling all of Yemen, independent, uh, recognized by the world, a state that Iran uh, can actually use as another uh, pawn on, on the chessboard. That has been denied. Now, having said that, this was a very complicated war. And I think uh, we did very well also, because as you mentioned, you know, in the Arab world, we have a very professional army. This is an army uh, that actually retires officers, that has people who are in the field, uh, you know, sort of brigadiers and, and colonels and generals who are in their 40s, who have seen operation. And just to give you a number here, uh, in a small army such as the UAE's, 20,000 of them have seen service in Afghanistan because of rotation. And this is very unusual in the Arab world where you have an army that is actually very capable, although it's an army of a small state, but it's very capable. So did we achieve, uh, did, we, did we succeed in Yemen? I think history will tell. Did we achieve some of our goals? Yes, we did. Did we uh, fail in some of our goals? Yes, we did. But again, I think this is the way that, that we look at it. Uh, and again, in Yemen, I think the different thing in Yemen, all the other instances you mentioned 
we always had a major uh, superpower and Western presence there, whether it was in Libya or in Afghanistan or in the Balkans. In Yemen, this was really an Arab coalition. And this was the first time that an Arab coalition had to uh, respond to a geostrategic threat where Iran was going to change perhaps the geostrategic balance uh, in the region. I know that uh, you know, people will take issue with some of uh, my conclusions, but these are the things uh, I see. And as I said, we've never really seen the sort of clear victory in the region uh, in the last 20 years. So I would say that this is more in line of what we have seen in the region rather than an aberration of what we are seeing in the region. I'd now like to shift uh, again to um, current relations between the UAE and uh, Turkey, the region's largest economy, as you pointed out. Um, and they say a week's a long time in politics, but two years is an eternity in Middle Eastern politics. And I noted um, that at the Asian Society in uh, an interview you did with former Prime Minister uh, Rudd from Australia, um, you referred to Egypt and Turkey as two of the region's old states with whom you had no problems. Um, but in July this year, you wrote uh, in the French media that, uh, and I quote, Erdogan has made it clear that it is, does not wish to be a bridge between Europe and the Arab world. Last week, the Turkish Defence Minister described the UAE as a functional country that serves others politically or militarily and is used remotely. And you, in response or semi-response, tweeted that relations are not managed by threats and there is no place for colonialist delusions in this day and age. Um, now, those are quite undiplomatic uh, words from a very senior diplomat. What's gone wrong between the UAE and Turkey in the, in the last two years? I think the, the main issue is uh, we have, a, we have a, an Arab regional system that is going through a very difficult time. You know, the Arab world is already polarized, uh, but the Arab world is in agreement over one thing which is non-interference in its own affairs. So, you know, if you have issues and problems within the Arab world, there, there's, there's a, like a red line around what is considered, you know, Arab territorial sovereignty. And I think this is a major agreement by all countries, all the way from Morocco to Oman. And I think this is an essential uh, and fundamental part of uh, the Arab world's uh, regional system, weak as it is. Uh, over the last uh, uh, 20 years or so, Iran has been known to uh, encroach on the Arab world system of, uh, you know, uh, of boasting that it is controlling four Arab capitals. And uh, Iran has always been seen as the very unruly and difficult neighbor because of its aggressive uh, policy towards the Arab world. Now, many of these important regional players see a soft belly to their south, which is really the Arab world. The Turks, to, for a long time, and this is when uh, you refer also to those uh, remarks, the Turks for a long time have acted more as a Westphalian state, uh, conscious of uh, borders, conscious of uh, of non-interference in their affairs. And, you know, the, the, <clears throat> the Atatürkist dictum, really, of Turkey was peace at home and peace in the world. So clearly, this was the sort of Turkish foreign policy for decades and decades. I think with, uh, with the AKP being uh, bolder and realizing that uh, there are several uh, opportunities, geostrategic opportunities, that policy has changed. So as a result, Turkey was shut out of Europe. And as a result, Turkey started to encroach more on the Arab world. And this is a policy that has developed slowly, but has been speeded up uh, 
for different reasons. I think there are several things happening here. On the one hand, it's very ideological because the AKP is very much, um, um, you know, an ideological party. And the AKP is seeing that it, perhaps it might have a role in Turkey leading, uh, you know, the, this, uh, the Islamic world. As Iran is leading the Shia world, Turkey can lead the Islamic world. So this is, in, in, in one instance, uh, very much ideologically driven. I think number two, from our view also, is geostrategic. Turkey is also positioning itself to be a key in two or three of the issues of our times in the region. And the Syrian issue is one uh, particular issue, and now Libya is emerging as an, another particular issue. It will strengthen Turkey also geostrategically in the Eastern Mediterranean, where Turkey does not want to be left out of all these gas fines that are uh, promising in the Eastern uh, uh, Mediterranean. Uh, number three is clearly there is uh, an Islamist, uh, you know, several groups. The, major, the most important is the Muslim Brotherhood. Now, you've really had the rise of political Islam since 1979. And I think right now we're seeing political Islam, Islam on the wing. Because clearly for 30 years, political Islam has not been able to give the region what I would call uh, a progressive and, uh, and successful uh, platform to looking towards the future. And people are realizing that. But the AKP is part of that and parcel of that group, and as a result, is 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 trying to uh, to lead it. It is interesting <clears throat> that both Iran and Turkey, in trying, in 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 my opinion, they can see that there are shifts in the international system, and they can see that a large regional country can actually gain some extra space in the international system. And Turkey and Iran both see themselves as important regional players, and they are. Uh, but clearly, they cannot, um, they cannot exert influence to the north, where the old Soviet republics are there, because this will be uh, a conflict uh, with Russia about political influence and so forth, so on and so forth. So clearly, the most attractive region with all its troubles, all its problems, is the, the sudden belly. And that is really the Arab world. And this is what we've really seen. So really, our counter argument to the Turks and Iranians is you are historical neighbors of the Arab world. Your current policy of aggressive expansionism is putting you in a confrontation with the Arab world. You're better off. Uh, uh, propagating a Westphalian model where you respect uh, borders, you respect non-interference, and so on and so forth. And I think it is very, very interesting how the three countries, and I speak here about Turkey, uh, Iran, and, and Russia, and Libya, have created a very unique model of confrontation and cooperation. But the main thing is today they have a lock on the Syrian issue because you, they are really the ones who decide what happens. It's not the UN, it's not the rest of the Arab world. And I think from that perspective, the UAE's view is that we did make a huge mistake by kicking Syria out of the Arab League because we burnt all our bridges and currently our influence on, the Arab, on, on one of really the seminal crisis of the Arab world of the 21st century you know, the Syrian tragedy, our influence is zero. And as a result, I think the UAE and many other Arab countries are propagating the idea that Turkey, Iran, you're our neighbors, but you have to respect the Arab world's sovereignty. You cannot see your political success at the, uh, at the expense of expanding your influence, expanding your ideology, expanding your economic interests in the Arab world, because this will backfire. And I think this, uh, 
this is backfiring, and I think this is also uh, resulting really on weakening, uh, you know, political Islam, which has really dominated the region for the last 30 years. Now, looking from afar from Australia and looking at the region from here, um, there seems to be little coherence in the Trump administration's policy towards the Middle East. Um, in, in fact, in terms of a number of uh, policies, but the Middle East in particular, you know, we've seen a Palestinian peace deal that didn't appear to include um, any Palestinian voices with the announcement of a withdrawal of US force from Syria. And then there was a non-withdrawal and a partial withdrawal, but a unilateral withdrawal from the JCPOA to be replaced by a policy of maximum pressure that doesn't appear to have a really an achievable aim. Um, does the Trump administration's approach to um, the Middle East, um, A, um, raise questions in your mind about its coherence? And secondly, is, the, is there a broader feeling um, that Washington has lost interest in the region or is a much weaker player these days than it ever has been in the past? Again, I mean, this is... Uh... This is a discussion that's, uh, that precedes really the Trump administration. Uh, it's a discussion about America's role in the world and America's as role, as you mentioned, particularly in the, in the Middle East. Uh, and, and there are two schools of thought. There's a school of thought <clears throat> that says that this is really cyclical within American uh, you know, uh, policy towards various regions in the world. So the idea that uh, you will have, uh, you know, an American uh, age of engagement and then you have an American age of retrenchment. So that is one view. The other view really on this is that we're seeing something new. The Middle East is less uh, important here. Certainly the Middle East is more complicated, but I can see from our perspective I don't see an American withdrawal. I mean, I see an American engagement, but it is perhaps a much more careful engagement in, uh, in the region. And as I said, this is not really a Trump era thing. It's something that precedes the Trump era. It, it's something that's post-Afghanistan, post-Iraq. Uh, again, you know, like somebody said, you know, if you try and run away from the Middle East, the Middle East will run behind you and catch you. You know, and I think the, the, the single important thing, unfortunately, is that most of the uh, or majority of the major crises today, life crises, are in, in the Middle East, unfortunately. And as a result, I think that many of these issues have, uh, you know, have uh, an effect, you know, a cascading effect on many countries. And I think also understanding, for example, terrorism, for example, has very much a Middle Eastern dimension because of Afghanistan and because of other developments that we have seen because of ISIS, etc. So it's a cascading effect that will affect many, many uh, Arab countries. My view, my view is we're not going to see uh, and we're not seeing a withdrawal of interest, but we're seeing, I think, a change of interest. And I think from the UAE's perspective, uh, this is important uh, because, you know, we look at America's involvement in the region as a positive uh, involvement. We look at America as our major strategic ally. But I don't think it's also in our interest to get our major strategic ally embroiled in wars in the region. But I think that the, uh, the overall, the 360 relationship that we have is the important part. And I think the approach uh, on Iran is essentially correct. The approach on Iran is that Iran understood the JCPOE as a carte blanche, uh, uh, recognizing its uh, dominant role in the region. And the JCPOE was not meant to do that. But Iran, definitely, if you compare Iran's engagement in the region and aggressiveness in the region uh, post JCPOA, it was much higher. And I think we, all of us, uh, you know, here in the UAE, we think we are beyond the JCPOA. 
but we are beyond the JCPOA. We can't really return back to the JCPOA. But what we really need is what we call JCPOA plus, plus plus call it. And here, what we're really talking about is addressing the three baskets of Iran's nefarious activity in the region, uh, nuclear, missile, and regional. And I think we should, uh, in, in our view, this has to be done politically. We need to de-escalate in the region. We need Iran to be engaged. And I think this is what's being offered right now. And we need a process to make sure that Iran also benefits from this because Iran has to be also part of what we see at some point in the future as a, a region of stability and prosperity. You've got to give them the carrot also. And I think this is important. Uh, but definitely uh, going back, this is a changing world and this is a changing international system. And our choices, difficult choices sometimes are made because we don't have the luxury of, of the past. We don't have the luxury of sitting back and waiting for somebody to, uh, to maintain the stability of the region. And that is why you're seeing new players emerge in the region, such as Turkey, old players uh, trying to uh, you know, create more influence, such as Iran, because they realize also that there are vacuums and they realize that they can fill the vacuum. And our counter proposal is, yes, we want you to fill the vacuum, but we want you to be a part of the solution. We want you to be part of the stability and prosperity of the region. We don't want the region to be carved out uh, as you are doing right now, because this is not going to work and going to actually polarize further what we are seeing in the region. Um, listen, we probably will finish this, uh, with this question before we take questions from the audience, but we really can't talk about um, the US uh, without talking uh, about China in the same breath these days. And certainly um, the rise of China has been one of the key debates in uh, Australia over the last six uh, to 12 months. And one of the, one of the major issues is um, a feeling that perhaps Australia and other liberal democracies have focused on ec economic relations with China and it blinded us to the difference in values between uh, those of liberal democracies and one party states and that the best way to uh, ameliorate Chinese behaviour um, is to take a unified and a public stance um, when, they when we believe that they've overstepped uh, the line and human rights tends to be one of these uh, issues. Um, now, there seems to be a disparity between the way that uh, liberal democracies view this and perhaps uh, some people in uh, the Arab world. And I use these two examples. In, in 2019, Australia and the other Western uh, democracies criticised the actions by the Chinese government against uh, the Muslim Uyghurs in a letter to the UN Human Rights Council. But the UAE and the other Gulf states signed a letter supporting the Chinese stance. And in June this year, Australia and Western liberal democracies criticised Chinese, uh, that China's new national security law for Hong Kong in the council, but the UAE and other Gulf states supported uh, China's position. Um, this is a, a two-part question, I suppose. First of all, do you think there's a disparity in the way that uh, the Gulf states view uh, China um, and Chinese policies and the way that Western liberal democracies view it, particularly in terms of human rights? And what do you believe that future holds for China and Chinese relations with countries in the region more broadly? Well, again, China is emerging as a major player. In our region, China still is very much an economic and, uh, and commercial player. But again, with China really becoming more of a te technological powerhouse, I think that relationship is shifting. And I would also say <clears throat> that uh, many, many countries, including us, will have quite a, a, a rough period ahead of us because of uh, US-Chinese uh, polarization. And here is because you have to really uh, sort of navigate between your main strategic partner, 
i.e. the United States, and your main commercial partner, i.e. China. And I think we're not alone in, in that position. So again, I think managing that up to now has been, uh, has, has been you know, uh, fine overall, but I think this will be a more difficult uh, patch as we move uh, forward. Now, having said that, uh, I think, yes, I agree with you that uh, foreign policy is very much reflective of what value system you put there. And I think for us, um, you know, the, the issue of non-interference is very important. Uh, the issue of, uh, of uh, you know, resolving these issues privately, not publicly, is very important. And I think that's reflected. But then again, this is not really a Gulf symptom. I mean, the OIC, uh, which is, you know, the main, uh, you know, organization with Muslim states, members, etc. There's a feeling that naming and shaming China is not the way forward. But at the same time, engaging with it over the Uyghur issue is, uh, is, is more important. And I think this is the approach that uh, the OIC and others have to a certain extent taken with other less important countries, such as Myanmar, for example. Uh, it hasn't always succeeded, but I think it is reflective also that you, know, you can't clone countries and make them all act and react the same, uh, the same way. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis that, I think, what is what will be a very important element will be technology. Again, uh, China is emerging. China 10 years ago was purely a commercial and transactional partner uh, for many countries in the region. But again, as you see, Chinese technology becoming, uh, you know, more at the forefront really of uh, many things happening. I think many of these countries, uh, including the UAE, will have these difficult issues of managing the polarization that, that we are seeing. And this is not only uh, a Trump uh, polarization. I think this is more uh, within the American system. Maybe the nuance is different, but this, in my opinion, will be one of the issues that all countries will have uh, to grapple. But we're not really seeing also the very actively the political side of China that you are seeing in your region. And, you know, as you know, many of the China experts uh, differ on what China seeks. Does China really want to be uh, a major superpower along the lines of the United States or the old Soviet Union, which many argue it doesn't, but it does want to be a major uh, player uh, within its own cultural context. I think all these things are uh, things that we are seeing. I'm not a China expert, uh, but as I see it, I see uh, a China that's becoming more and more important and powerful because also it is willing to uh, give loans to many countries. It's willing to embark on uh, various infrastructure uh, programs in many third world countries, things that the Europeans, for example, don't do anymore. And I think here, uh, you know, the Chinese uh, appetite will make also a difference as we see in many, many uh, other areas. As far as we are concerned, uh, you know, we are, uh, you know, they are our major uh, commercial partner. I think our trade with them is one of the largest uh, in the Middle East, and uh, to be honest, we 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 are uh, cognizant of uh, you know the the more and more polarized situation vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, U.S.-China relations, and we realize that this will create uh, a lot of uh, difficult navigating uh, moving forward. Um. Listen, I was, I'm very conscious of the time, but I'll just uh, take one of the um, questions we received from the audience. If we were to go through uh, them all, we'd probably still be here tomorrow. Um, but one of the questions was whether you think um, uh, the Sultanate of Oman will change at all now that there's a new leader uh, in the position and, and there are um, 
reports, for instance, that uh, a multi-billion dollar development contract with an Emirati company, Dumark, uh, has been cancelled recently. But I just ask for your uh, general observations about um, whether um, a new uh, ruler of Oman, uh, who's obviously going to have to take time um, to uh, put his feet under the table, do you think um, we'll see the same kind of uh, stable, centrist um, um, policies in the region and internationally that Oman has been uh, famous for up until now? Well, uh, definitely, yes. I mean, it will be uh, it will be continuity and change. I mean, Oman is, uh, you know, an established country uh, with the ruling family there since the early 18th century. So it will be continuity and change, of course, is you will always have a new sultan uh, put a certain imprint uh, after 40 years of rule by uh, the legendary Sultan Qaboos. Uh, we in the UAE, uh, you know, Oman is our most important partner uh, along with Saudi Arabia. And because we have, we have what I call a live border with Oman. We have uh, basically villages that are half in Oman and half in the UAE. We have families that are linked. We have a live border there. And I think uh, for us, uh, we have a we have a vested interest in a prosperous and stable Oman, as they do in ours at the same time. The Damak deal, I think, is a private deal. I mean, private deals work and don't work. There are uh, a multitude of UAE investments in Oman uh, and Omani investments in the UAE. Many are prospering very well and doing very well. And you will get also some that have overextended, overreached, or, uh, you know, the economic climate was not right or whatever. That I would say is normal and I wouldn't put any political uh, emphasis uh, there. Um, listen, Dr. Gagash, um, we could be here for uh, a lot longer uh, than this, but we promised you uh, about 45 minutes out of your very busy uh, schedule and you've been generous enough um, to give us that. So we'll uh, also honor our uh, agreement. So thank you very much. Dr. Gargash, for, you know, for what we've uh, done today, not only the time, but your insights uh, that you've given us. Um, relations between the UAE and Australia are strong and they've grown stronger over the last 15 years. And I'm sure that uh, that trend will continue into the future. Um, I'd also like to thank everybody else for joining us um, at this latest Lowy Institute live event. Now, our, our next live stream event will be announced on our website shortly, so make sure, shortly, so make sure that you keep an eye out for it. Um, but in the meantime, I'd just like to, again, express our thanks to you, Dr. Gargash, from um, myself personally and the Institute uh, generally um, for joining us. Um, and I hope that you and your family stay safe and well in the future.